I'll introduce myself. My name's, uh, since I don't know everybody on the screen, my name's Andy Smith. Uh, my Dharma name is uh, Hakaju, and I've been a member at the Zen Center for uh, many years. And also we have a Zen, I live in uh, De uh, close to Deadwood, South Dakota, and we have a Zen group that meets in Rapid City also that's also a white plum Sangha Zen group. So um, I'd like to... Uh, to thank everyone for coming to listen, and also to thank my uh, my teachers for giving me this assignment. Um, one thing I learned about this is I don't think I I didn't have any real strong impressions of the guy I'm going to talk about, Master Nansen. And um, after doing the research on him, um, I would I have a much respect for him. He was very uh, uh, dedicated. Uh, powerful teacher, and hopefully I can share some of that. Um, so for the resources for this talk, I used, uh, uh, I read uh, John C. Wu's uh, The Golden Age of Zen. There was some information about uh, Master Nansen in that. Um, the, uh, the appendix in Thomas Cleary's Blue Cliff Record had a pretty good uh, uh, page or two about Master Nansen. Um, in the uh, Roaring Stream by uh, uh, Nelson Foster and Jack Shoemaker. They had a, about a page about him. Um, I used Roshi's book, The Transmission of the Light, just to make sure I had the Chinese and Japanese names right. And then I looked on, uh, uh, you know, Wikipedia and Google and stuff like that. And um, one thing I found, you know, this happened a long time ago. Nansen lived 1,200 over 1200 years ago. So there isn't like a huge amount of information. It's not like Hakuin or something like that, where you have uh, almost sort of a day by day thing. Um, and a lot of the information kind of overlapped. Um, so I didn't really find a lot as much stuff as I wanted to find, but uh, I did find some pretty interesting things. Um, and I hope I can share that with you. So Master Nansen, as we know him in Chinese, it's Nanquan Puyan. Um, his family name was Wang. Um, so when he grew up, he would have been, if I understand this right, he would have been known as Punyan Wang. That would have been his name. Um, his students often called him Old Teacher Wang. Um, and he often referred to himself in the third person that way, apparently, and called himself Old Teacher Wang. Um, so depending on which source you go by, he was born in either 747 or 748 of the Common Era, and he died in 834 or 835. Um, he lived to be 87 years old. So that's, I mean, that in itself is pretty incredible. You know, I think life expectancy in the U.S. today is only 76 right now. Um, so 1,200 years ago, you know, before the time of antibiotics or anything like that, he was obviously a vigorous person with an unusual amount of energy. Um, and that really comes out pretty clearly, I think, in the stuff I, uh, uh, I found out about him. Um, I want to share my screen. So, okay, this is the Google Maps version of Tang Dynasty China. Very slow to load. I don't recommend it. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, so, um, um, Nanquan was born in Henan Province in, uh, in China. That's right there. Uh, it was the most uh, populous province in China at the time. And uh, it was also the center of culture religion, government, pretty much everything in, in ancient China was centered around this Henan province. It's a very rich agricultural province and it's got mountains uh, to the north and mountains to the south of it. Um, so today, Beijing is somewhere up in here and uh, Shanghai is kind of down here and uh, Wuhan, the, we're with the Wuhan Institute of Virology is about right in there, it's in Henan province. Um, so Henan province still exists to this day, and it's still, I don't know if it's the most populous, but I think it still may be. It's a very important province in China, and that's where uh, Nanquan was born. Um, so, he, you know, he probably, I mean, there's a good chance that he wasn't like the sixth patriarch, like an illiterate uh, woodcutter or something like that. I kind of think he may have come from a, a fairly substantial family and been really exposed to everything uh, Chinese culture had to offer back then, which was uh, uh, pretty substantial. Um, anyway, at age nine, he became a novice monk at Mount Dawai. 
Um, and Mount Douai is down in the south end of Hunan province right here. I looked for this on Google Maps and I couldn't find it. Um, I couldn't, you know, no matter what I looked or typed in, I could not come up with a Mount Douai. Um, so probably, I mean, mountains don't disappear, but probably the name has changed and maybe it's not, uh, doesn't have the importance that it did back in that time. Um, but, you know, I was just kind of impressed that at nine years old, he, he took vows as a novice monk. And obviously I would think his family would have had to have done, had to have been involved in that. Um, I can't, you know, I had two boys and uh, I can't imagine either of them uh, having the, what would you say, the, the, the sincerity and seriousness to do something like that at age nine. But um, as we've seen with some of the other uh, ancient masters, a lot of them took vows at a very early age. Um, you know, so it must have been a different culture back then with uh, uh, different values. And of course, they didn't have Nintendo and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, you know, he started on his spiritual path at a very early age. Um, he spent 20 years as a novice. And then when he was at, at age 30, he, uh, he took his full vows as a monk at Mount Song. And uh, Mount Song is on the north edge of Hunan. It's a, just past across the Yellow River. It's surrounded by a city called Defeng City, um, or Dengfeng City. Um, this is uh, this is a path to Mount Song. It's, it's a world cultural heritage site today. So you can see this uh, rather scary path that goes up there. You can also take a cable car if you want. Um, but they've, they've built this, uh, this walkway that goes up there. It's really looks like a, uh, kind of a scary thing. Um, it would be pretty cool, but what, uh, I would love to go there. And, and uh, I was on the internet. You can, you know, buy tickets and take a tour of Mount Song if you want. Um, you would hope that they were uh, the carpenters so were not hung over when they built this thing because it looks, uh, looks, it looks rickety. I don't know, <laughs> but it looks like a great, uh, a uh, very exciting walk um, and it's got these these uh, basaltic columns kind of like uh, just like uh, Devil's Tower in uh, southeastern Wyoming has um, anyway very cool but Mount Song was a uh, a major cultural center in China for uh, thousands of years um, it was the center of Buddhism Confucianism and Taoism and also a lot of government activity so it was a major, major center. Um, this is a picture of a temple that's there today on Mount Song. Probably something like this would have been where uh, Nanquan would have gone. You know, very beautiful, set into the rocks and that. Um, it says in some of the stuff I read that there's buildings existing there on Mount Song today that are over 2,000 years old. That means, you know, those buildings would have been like 800 years old when Nanquan went there. So it was a very ancient site. It was a cent center of... Uh, of uh, spiritual activities for uh, all three of the major religions of China, you know, Taoism, Buddhism, and Confucianism. And it's known as the birthplace of Chan Buddhism. Um, now, when I say Mount Song, Mount Song itself is one mountain in a range of mountains where there's 72 separate peaks. Um, and actually, Shaolin Temple is only about a mile from Mount Song, but Shaolin Temple uh, is really close and of course that's where Bodhidharma went and sat and you know started our our tradition in Buddhism um, so it's it's you know this was a very important place that he went to and took his full monk vows and uh, I just wanted to say when I was when I was researching this I, it really came clear to me how important um, mountains and Zen are and how deeply interlinked they are I've always really liked um, you know, when you're working on the koans and stuff, there's so many beautiful passages describing nature and stuff. And I've always been very appreciative of that, but I haven't given it a lot of thought. But, um, you know, the major events in Don Quan's life all happened on mountains. I mean, major events in his spiritual life anyway. And, um, you know, mountains in, in uh, uh, China were just considered sacred. And uh, there's, you know, hundreds of sacred mountains there, but there's five main ones. Uh, Mount Song is one of them, and the uh, next mountain we're going to talk about is also one of them. Um, but, you know, uh, I think in, uh, in, in Zen Buddhism, they have just always really revered nature and really appreciated the beauty of nature and stuff. And um, 
it goes a lot deeper than aesthetics, you know, and I think when when I think about the climate catastrophe that we seem to be just diving headfirst into it, it uh, I think this is important. It's very, very important for us today to to maintain that. And, you know, I don't know how we're going to help, but, uh, you know, so we have to. Um, there's just so many beautiful passages in our koan literature about, you know, nature and mountains. One of them I wrote down here was uh, a monk asked Daryu, you know, the physical body decomposes. What is the immutable reality body? Daryu said, the mountain flowers bloom like brocade. The valley streams brim blue as indigo. You know, that's a koan in the Blue Cliff Record. Um, but I just have always really loved that that appreciation of the beauty of nature. Um, Nansen was a very studious monk, and that's what makes me think he maybe came from a fairly wealthy family, because he was obviously pretty literate. Um, he studied the Vinaya first um, when he became a monk, which is the guidelines for monks, the rules of conduct and that, and it's uh, quite extensive. Uh, after that, he studied the Lankavatara Sutra and then the Abhatamska Sutra and then the Mahayama thought of Nagarjuna. Um, and he was known for being like quite a scholar. And, um, but after many years of study, he still, he still wasn't uh, satisfied. So he went to visit uh, Master Mazu, or Matsu we call him. And uh, it said in the uh, readings I did that on their first meeting, he, uh, he was, said to, was said to have instantly forgotten the net of delusions and delighted in Samadhi. So when he met Matsu, something, something happened. They had some kind of an encounter right at the start, and he realized that Matsu was his teacher. And he became Matsu's disciple, and then eventually he came to uh, full awakening. So after his awakening, um, he didn't uh, you know, just sit around, obviously. He went on pilgrimages to visit other teachers and continued his studies and uh, uh, you know, tried to deepen his understanding. Um, Matsu was like an incredible Zen teacher. Um, he had 139 enlightened disciples. Um, the three most illustrious were said to be Pai Cheng, that's Hyakujo, um, Layman Pang, and Nanquan Puyong. And it said that out of the 800 disciples in Matsu's assembly, uh, Nanquan Puyong was foremost, and no one would debate with him because he was so uh, knowledgeable and scholarly. Um, in 795, at the age of 48, which this is something about uh, Anansen that I thought was really, he just never stops, you know, the guy just kept going and kept going, kept going. I mean, I live in an area where there's a lot of Air Force retirees, and a lot of them are about, you know, 48. They put in their time and they retire and they move to the Black Hills because we have veteran services here. Um, but at 48, he, uh, he left uh, Matsu and he moved to uh, the Hongshan Mountains and built himself a hut on Nanquan Mountain. So the Hongshan Mountains are also called the Yellow Mountains in China. It's another one of the major big sacred mountains in China. This is a picture of this. this is Lotus Flower Peak, which is the highest peak in the Hongshan Mountains. Um, he moved to Mount Nanchuan, you know, which these Zen masters would take the names of the mountains they live, you know, which to me, I, you know, I never really thought, why did they do that? I knew they did that, but I think they just had a great respect for their landscape and nature, uh, period, you know. Um, so he moved to uh, Nanchuan Mountain and built a hut where he lived for the next 30 years. And it said he never came down from the mountain once. He just lived, lived up on this mountain in this hut that he built. Um, and you can look on Google Maps, and I did find Nanchuan Mountain. Um, it's there, and there's actually a marker there on the, on the map. It says Nanchuan Temple. Now, you, you scroll in there, zoom in, and you can't really see anything but tree cover, so I get the feeling that it might be just maybe a his, uh, historical plaque or, or something like that. You can't really see that there's any building or a road going to that area. It looks pretty uh, forested and remote, um, but, and I don't know if that actually even had anything to do with him, you know, but it might have. It might have. Um, but this Nanshuan Mountain, um, not very far from there, is Yunmin Peak. That's in the same range of mountains, in the Yellow Mountains. Um, and, you know, Yunmen, Unman, one of our great ancestors, that's where he would have built his monastery and lived. 
um, a lot of these uh, uh, references that we we read in the koans maybe and don't think about them that much come from these mountains. For instance, we have a koan in, in the Blue Cliff Record called the Hermit of Lotus Flower Peak. You know, I just never really thought about it, but that's Lotus Flower Peak right there. So there was a fellow living there and they're, they're, that's what who the koan's about. You know, these places really existed. That was kind of interesting. Um, anyway, Nan Quan lived there for 30 years by himself, you know, refining his practice. Here's another picture of the mountains. Um, these mountains are also no, they're also a world cultural natural heritage site. Um, and they're very popular for people to go and uh, visit. One of the things, there's several things they go and visit. One of them is they like to see the they're well known for being surrounded by fog and the fog creeps up the valleys in the, in the late afternoon and evening and people go there just to watch this. Another thing is you can see this rock there. It looks like a Buddha sitting overlooking uh, this valley and there's a lot of really interesting rock formations that have names that look like look like uh, people or, or spiritual figures um, and people go to, to see these things. Even today, um, it must have affected the monks that lived there. Um, you know, there was one, I didn't get a picture of it, but uh, it had a picture of this huge rock that kind of looked like uh, Quan Yin, and then below it were these rock pillars that looked like a bunch of uh, uh, monks or people standing, like listening to this one, and it's of course called Quan Yin Rock. Um, but it's very interesting, a very beautiful place, obviously. Um, so he, he stayed there and refined his uh, practice for 30 years living alone, which is, you know, I think rather incredible. I mean, actually, for 30 years and never come down off the mountain. Um, you know, how did he live? You know, I, I really wondered about that. I thought about how would I live if I tried to live out in the woods around here for 30 years, um, especially without raising animals for food, if I had to like gather my own food, uh, it would be extremely tough. I don't know if you could do it, you know. Um, there's a short period of time in the summer where you can get berries and stuff, but uh, um, I don't know, it'd be very tough, you know, crops would be really hard because the climate is so erratic and everything. So I kind of looked at this, looked into this, and it said uh, um, the area around the Nanchuan Mountains, the Yellow Mountains, here again, these are a very big mountain range where he went to live, um, 78 major peaks. Um, the highest one is Lotus Flower Peak, which is about 5,600 feet elevation. Um, the surrounding area is subtropical, so about similar to Memphis, Tennessee. Um, so long, hot, humid summers, and then rather short winters compared to what we have up here, or what you have even uh, down in Denver there. Um, but still, up in the mountains, it would be colder, you know, more snowy. They do get snow there. Um, you know, I don't think you can grow rice under like pine trees on a slope I don't know but uh, uh, I was trying to figure out what would you what would you grow and, I, and it was interesting there was a guy that used to write letters to the editor in our paper here and he was kind of a survivalist um, and he would always write about he wrote about that how would you survive he tried farming different things up in the Black Hills in the Black Hills proper not down in Rapid and most of his crops you know, he had poor luck with them. He said, you know, he couldn't survive on that. One thing he did say you could survive on was turnips and radishes. He said those did really well. And I thought that was kind of interesting because uh, case 30 in the Blue Cliff record, a monk asked Joshu, I've heard that you met Nansen in person. Is it true? Joshu said, Chin province produces giant radishes. So, you know, they may have been growing probably a lot of root crops, you know, beets, radishes, turnips, stuff like that to live to survive. Um, anyway, for 30 years, he lived in these mountains um, by himself, refining his practice, but he wasn't like hiding or unknown. He was, uh, he was actually, uh, his reputation grew and people would come to visit him. Uh, Huang Bo was known to come, that's Obaku, came to visit him, um, made a pilgrimage to see him. Uh, Jingsan, uh, let me see, make sure I get the name right here. Uh, 
Tongshan visited him. Uh, that's Tosan in our lineage, not Tozan, but Tosan. And another person that visited him that turned out to be very important to our whole history was uh, Lu Jen, the governor of the province, who became his disciple. Um, and he was known to go visit Nanquan in the mountains. So, at the beginning, they, those two developed a fairly close relationship, and that ended up being very important. At the beginning of the Tahoe era, around 827, Common Era, Nanquan was invited by Lu Gen to come down from the mountain and teach in the city. So he, so Lu Gen sponsored him to come to, um, I don't know, the city that's that's at the base of the mountains now is Hongshan City. I don't know. Uh, I didn't find anything about what it was then, but uh, he accepted. He accepted. So he began his formal teaching career when he was almost 80 years old. Um, you know, I mean, that's far past retirement age. It's far past the life expectancy of people even in the modern world. And he was taking on a whole huge, big, new endeavor, um, teaching a whole uh, uh, congregation of monks. But, uh, he was almost 80. He would have been 79 or, or 78. And uh, it's interesting, you know, his most famous student was Joshu, Zhao Zhou. And uh, Joshu also was known to start teaching when he was 80 years old. So uh, Nanquan taught in that capacity as the leader of a uh, congregation uh, a little less than a decade because um, he lived to be 87. But he must have been an extremely vigorous person who just wouldn't back off of anything because he was just going to keep going no matter what. He had 17 enlightened disciples. Among the most famous was, of course, Joshu, Zhaozhou, and a lot of the koans that we have with Nansen have Joshu in them also. Uh, Chengsha Jinsen, who we know as Chosa. There's uh, Zihu Lizong, and I'm not familiar with that person. I couldn't find anything about him. Um, and then Lugen, the governor. It was kind of interesting, you know, that, uh, um, you know, government and religion are both sources of social power. And um, so, you know, quite often they're, they either back each other up or they're at odds. They quite often are at war with each other. You know, there was many suppressions of Buddhism in ancient China. But in this case, um, the governor really sponsored a Nanquan. And because of that, we have we have him as a teacher. You know, we have to wonder if if he hadn't met Lugan and developed a relationship with him, if he would have ever come down off that mountain, he might have just disappeared in the mists of history and we would, uh, we would never even have heard of him. Excuse so, me, like, Joe, are you going to share your screen more? Are you uh, done no, sharing not, I don't have any more pictures, sorry. Well, then maybe you should close the screen sharing and then we, we can look at you. Oh, great. Oh. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> but, you know, if, 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 uh, if he hadn't had a relationship with Lu Gen, he might have just disappeared in the mists of history, you know. Um, for instance, you know, there's probably been, there are probably many, many, many other uh, wonderful teachers that lived in those mountains in that time period that we've never, ever heard of because they just didn't get the opportunity to teach to a wider audience, you know, for instance, the Hermit of Lotus Flower Peak, you know, we, he's just as far as I know, in one koan, it doesn't really say much about him. So you just wonder who that person was. But Nanquan did come down and did teach in the city. And because of that, we have a fair extensive record of koans of his. He's four times in the Mumonkan, two times in the Blue Cliff Record, five times in the Book of Equanimity, and 17 times in the Book of Entangling Vines, which is a uh, that's a book of Japanese koans. It's not really in our main curriculum, but a lot of them are in the uh, miscellaneous koans. Uh, a lot of these koans are dialogues between he and Joshu. Now, probably the most famous, or I'm certainly the most famous, would be Case 14 in the Mumon Khan, Nansen Kills a Cat. Um, if you haven't heard this koan, it's really, it's a, a fantastic koan. Uh, great. It's a great koan. I'll read it. It says, One of the monk, once the monks of the eastern and western halls were disputing about a cat. Nansen, holding up the cat, said, Monks, if you can say a word of Zen, I will spare the cat. If you cannot, I will kill it. No monk could answer. Nansen finally killed the cat. In the evening, when Joshu came back, Nansen told him of the incident. Joshu took off his sandal, put it on his head, and walked off. Nansen said, if you had been there, I could have saved the cat. I mean, this is a, 
it's a great koan, perplexing. You know, the first thing is, what's a word of Zen? And what good is it if it doesn't affect your life right now? Another thing about it is, you know, Nansen would have been in his 80s when he did this. Um, you know, he's, uh, he's a guy you don't want to double dog dare. I can, I can guarantee you that, you know. He's, he put himself into a corner with this cat, but then, you know, he had to, he had, you know, the monks couldn't, couldn't save him from what he had determined to do. Um, you know, he was a vigorous, a vigorous fellow, the, you know, unrelenting. I get this feeling from him that he was unrelenting. Um, and I've heard many teachers, you know, a lot of questions. Did he really kill a cat? I mean, would that be right? Would a Zen master do that? Uh, it kind of breaks our ideas of, of what a Zen master could do, because that's clearly wrong to, to kill an innocent animal. Um, and I've heard Zen teachers say, no, no, he would, he would not have done that. Um, and I don't know. I wasn't there. Um, but I would say in the koan, he killed the cat, at least in the koan. Um, and I think that that cat's died like a million times in the last 1200 years, and it's still alive in our practice today. And um, I thought about this while, while I was writing this, and I thought, you know, that, that cat is a great bodhisattva for us. It really is, and we should all give it a bow. Um, the cat is a, is a wonderful bodhisattva. <laughs> Another favorite koan with Nansan and, and Joshu is case 19 in the Mumon Khan. Ordinary mind is Tao. Joshu once asked Nansan, what is Tao? Nansan answered, ordinary mind is Tao. Then should we direct ourselves towards it or not, asked Joshu. If you try to direct yourself towards it, you go away from it, answered Nansan. Joshu continued, if we do not try, how can we know that it is, that it is Tao? Nansan replied, the Tao does not belong to knowing or not knowing. Knowing is illusion, not knowing is blankness. If you really attain to Tao of no doubt, it's like the great void, so vast and boundless. How then can there be right and wrong in the Tao? With these words, Joshu was suddenly enlightened. I think that's you know such a great call just because of that one line in there. Uh, knowing is illusion, not knowing is blankness. I mean, what does that leave you with? He kind of takes away everything there. Um, so I think that's very great. Um, another one from the Book of Equanimity, Case 91, Nonsen's Peony. Attention, Riko Taifu, and in the, uh, in the uh, commentary on this, it said Riko Taifu is Governor Lugen. So Riko Taifu, on one occasion, asked Master Nonsen, Dharma Master Joe is exceedingly wonderful. He said, heaven and earth have one root. The 10,000 things are one body. Nansen, pointing to the peony in the garden, said, Taifu, people nowadays see these flowers as if in a dream. So those are three really great koans with Nansen. Um, there's a couple other koans I wanted to bring up um, that I just kind of stumbled across that um, kind of concern Nanquan and death and a water buffalo. And they're all very similar and they're just kind of interesting. Um, the first one involves Joshu again. It's case 90 in the book of uh, Entangling Vines. Zhao Zhou asked Nan Quan, a person who knows it, where should he go when he dies? Nan Quan answered, he should become a water buffalo at the believer's house by the foot of the mountain. Thank you, teacher, for this in instruction, Zhao Zhou said. Nanquan said, last night at midnight, the moonlight shone on the mountain. And there's that beautiful phrase that we see in, in our koans so often. So that koan, you know, that's a little puzzling, I would say. It's very similar to one that's in our miscellaneous koans with Isan, Isan's buffalo. Isan once told a student, I, an old monk, will be reborn as a buffalo in the front house of the temple a hundred years hence. And five words will be on the buffalo's side. Monk, Isan, such and such. If you call this monk Isan, it is a buffalo. If you call it a buffalo, it is monk Isan, such and such. Tell me, what do you call it? Kyozan made a bow and went away. So there we have the, the water buffalo again, which is a little curious. Um, and the last one um, is from the... Uh, Jingdi 
are a record of the transmission of the lamp. And I don't really know what that book is, but that was the reference given for it. I didn't read that. But it's a, it's a, a, it describes Nansen's death. And it said, when the master was about to die, the head monk asked him, your reverence, a hundred years from now, where will you be? I shall be a water buffalo at the foot of the hill, said the master. Will it be all right for me to follow you, asked the head monk. If you follow me, you must hold a stalk of grass in your mouth, said Don Quan. So the, one of the commentaries I read on this said, well, he's, he's just kind of uh, breaking our expectations by saying that he's going to be reborn as an animal, which, uh, you know, the animal world would be not where you'd expect a Zen master, a great Zen teacher to, to be reborn. But in the uh, commentary for the um, Entangling Vines, it actually explains it a little better. And I think it's, it was interesting. It said, in ancient China, those who had died with unpaid debts were reborn as water buffaloes at the creditor's household. The characters of the dead person's name would often appear on the animal. The person's descendant then would buy the animal, paying off the debt. So, you know, I thought about that and I thought, well, maybe, maybe what he's saying is just that he has uh, an unpaid debt of gratitude towards his life, you know. Um, I guess that's what I got out of it. I thought it was really uh, interesting. So Master Nansen died at dawn on a winter morning, 834 or 835. He was 87 years old. His last recorded words were, the star has been fading and the lamp growing dim for a long time. Do not say that I came or went. In a different book, uh, the translation of that line, last line is, don't say that I alone have to come and go. I think I, the first one makes more, has more coherence with what I understand about Zen. Um, but I think, you know, trying to translate uh, Japanese or Chinese character writing into English is, there's just a lot of built-in vagueness that it can be taken many different ways, unlike uh, a lot of our language. So it's hard to translate correctly. It says, a year after his death, his body was enshrined in a pagoda. Um, there was a picture that I didn't manage to get, I couldn't find it the second time, but uh, of a pagoda forest on Song Mountain, where they had just this huge field with hundreds of these pagodas in it, in it. Um, and apparently, you know, they were all like 25, 30 feet tall, something like that. And apparently that's what, uh, if you were a highly esteemed individual, they would uh, enshrine your body in one of these things. Um, so that's what happened to his body. The last thing I want to read of his is uh, another case, case 242 in the Entangling Binds. An ancient worthy, and there again, it's this one's Master Nanquan, an ancient worthy said, speak a word from the place where wisdom cannot reach. So after reading all this stuff, and that's, that's all I have, and after reading all this, I just got the feeling that Master Nansen was like, you know, 110% his whole life, you know, he was just absolutely put everything he had into his practice. And he was totally uh, not going to take a step backward, you know, um, just completely unrelenting. And uh, uh, I don't mean that in a, like a cruel way or something. I just mean he was just totally, absolutely dedicated to what he was doing. And uh, I have a lot more respect for him than what I started with, not that I didn't respect him, I just hadn't thought about him that much. All right, thank you.